Welcome to the last lesson, lesson 14. Um, uh, we're going to be looking at image segmentation today, amongst other things. But before we do, uh, a bit of show and tell from last week. Um, Elena Harley uh, did something really interesting, which was she tried finding out what would happen if you did cycle GAN on just uh, three or four hundred images. And I really like these projects where people just go to Google Image Search, you know, using the uh, the API or one of the libraries out there. Some of our students have created some very good libraries for interacting with Google Images API. Download a bunch of stuff that they're interested in. Um, in this case, some photos and some uh, stained glass windows. And um, uh, yeah, with three or four hundred photos of that, she trained a model. She trained actually a few different models. This is one I particularly liked. And as you can see, with quite a small number of images, you know, she gets some very nice stained glass uh, effects. Um, so I thought that was a interesting example of um, yeah, using pretty small amounts of data that was uh, readily available that she was able to download pretty quickly. Um, and there's some more information about that on the forum if you're interested. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to wonder about what kinds of things people will come up with with this kind of uh, generative model. It's clearly a great artistic medium. Um, it's clearly a great medium for forgeries and fakeries. Um, yeah, I wonder what other kinds of things people will realize they can do with these kind of generative models. I think audio is going to be the next big area. Uh, and also very like interactive type stuff. Uh, NVIDIA uh, just uh, released a paper showing an um, interactive kind of photo repair tool where you just like brush over an object and it replaces it with, you know, a deep learning generated replacement very nicely. Those kinds of uh, interactive tools I think will be very interesting too. Um, so before we talk about segmentation, we've got some stuff to finish up from last time, um, which is that we looked at doing style transfer um, by actually directly optimizing pixels. And, you know, like with most of the things in part two, it's not so much that I'm wanting you to uh, understand um, style transfer per se, but the kind of idea of optimizing your input directly and using activations as part of a loss function is really the key kind of takeaway here. So it's interesting then to kind of see the, the I thought it was effectively the follow-up paper, you know, not from the same people, but a, the, the paper that kind of came next in the, in the sequence of these kind of vision generative models with this one from um, Justin Johnson and uh, folks at Stanford. Um, and it, it actually does the same thing, style transfer, but it does it in a different way. Rather than optimizing the pixels, we're going to go back to something much more familiar and optimize some weights. And so specifically, we're going to train a model which learns to take a photo and translate it into um, a photo on the, in the style of a particular artwork. So each ConvNet will learn to produce one kind of style. Um, now, it turns out that getting to that point, there's an intermediate point, which is, I actually think, kind of more, more useful and uh, takes us halfway there, um, which is something called super resolution. So we're actually going to start with super resolution um, because then we'll build on top of super resolution to finish off the style transfer, uh, convnet based style transfer. And so super resolution is where we take a low res image. We're going to take 72 by 72 and uh, upscale it to a larger image, 288 by 288 in our case, um, trying to create you know, a higher res image that, that looks as real as possible. Um, and so this is a pretty challenging thing to do because at 72 by 72 there's not that much information about a lot of the details. And the cool thing is that uh, we're going to do it in a way, um, as we tend to do with vision models, um, which is not tied to the input size. So you could totally then take this model that, uh, and, and apply it to a 288 by 288 image and get something that's uh, four times bigger on each side, so 16 times bigger than that. Um, and, uh, and often it even kind of works better at that level because you're really introducing a lot of 
a lot of detail into the finer details and you could really print out a high resolution print of something which earlier on was pretty pixelated. So this is the um, notebook called Enhance. Um, and it is a lot like that kind of uh, CSI style enhancement where we're going to take something that appears like the information is just not there and we kind of invent it but the, the ConfNet's going to learn to invent it in a way that's consistent with the information that is there. So hopefully, you know, it's kind of inventing the right information. And one of the really nice things about this kind of problem is that we can create our own data set as big as we like without um, any labeling requirements because we can easily create a low-res image from a high-res image just by downsampling our images. So something I would love some of you to try during the week would be to do other types of image-to-image -image translation where you can invent kind of lab labels, invent your dependent variable. For example, um, de-skewing, you know, so either recognize things that have been rotated by 90 degrees or better still, that have been rotated by 5 degrees and straighten them. Colorization. So turn, make a bunch of images into black and white and learn to put the color back again. Um, uh, noise reduction. You know, maybe um, do a, a really low quality JPEG save um, and uh, learn to put it back to how it should have been um, and so forth. Uh, or um, yeah, or maybe taking something that's like in a 16 color palette and put it back to a higher color palette. I think these things are all interesting because they can like be used to take, um, you know, pictures that you may have taken back on crappy old digital cameras before they were high resolution, or you may have scanned in some old photos that have now kind of faded or whatever. You know, I think it's a really useful thing to be able to do. And also it's good. It's a good project because it's like really similar to what we're doing here, but different enough that you'll come come across some interesting challenges on the way, I'm sure. So um, I'm going to use um, ImageNet again. Again, you don't need to use all of ImageNet at all. I just happen to have it lying around. You can download the 1% sample of ImageNet from files.fast.ai. You can use any set of pictures you have lying around, honestly. Um, and in this case, as I say, we don't really have labels per se, um, so I'm just going to um, give everything a label of zero just so we can use it with our existing infrastructure more easily. Um, now, because I'm, in this case, pointing at a folder that contains all of ImageNet, I certainly don't want to wait for all of ImageNet to finish to run an epoch. So here I'm just, um, uh, most of the time I would set keep percent to like one or two percent, and then I just generate a bunch of random numbers and then I just grab those, keep those which are less than 0.02 um, and so that lets me quickly subsample um, my rows. Um, all right, so we're going to use um, VGG16 and uh, VGG16 um, is something that we haven't really looked at in this class. Um, but it's a very simple, uh, very simple model where we take our normal, presumably three channel input, and we basically run it through a number of three by three convolutions. And then from time to time, we put it through a two by two max pool. And then we do a few more three by three convolutions. Max pool, so on and so forth. And then um, this is kind of um, our backbone, I guess. And then we, um, we don't do an average pooling layer, an adaptive average pooling layer. Um, after a few of these, we end up with this, you know, seven by seven grid as usual. I think it's about seven by seven by five, 12, something like that. Um, and so rather than average pooling, we do something different, which is we flatten the whole thing. So that spits out a very long vector of activations of size 7 times 7 times 5, 12, if memory serves correctly. And then that gets fed into 
two fully connected layers, each one of which has 4096 activations, and then one more fully connected layer which has however many classes. So if you think about it, the weight matrix here is huge. It's, you know, 7 by 7 by 512 by 4096. And it's because of that weight matrix, really, that VGG went out of favor pretty quickly, because uh, it takes a lot of memory, and takes a lot of computation, and it's really slow. And there's a lot of redundant stuff going on here, because really, those 512 activations are are not that specific to which of those 7 by 7 grid cells they're in, right? But when you have this entire weight matrix here of every possible combination, it treats all of them uniquely, right? And so that can also lead to generalization problems, because um, there's just a lot of weights and so forth. Um, my view is that there's, you know, that the approach that's used in every modern network, which is here we do an adaptive average pooling in Keras, that would be known as a global average pooling, or in FastAI we generally do a concat, adaptive concat pooling, um, which spits it straight down to a 512 long activation. Um, I think that's throwing away too much geometry. Um, so pr to me probably the correct answer is somewhere in between and would involve some kind of um, factored convolution or some kind of uh, tensor decomposition, um, which, yeah, maybe some of us can think about in the coming months. Um, so for now, anyway, we, we've gone from one extreme, which is the adaptive average pooling, to the other extreme, which is this huge flattened fully connected layer. So uh, a couple of things which are interesting about VGG that make it still useful today. Um, the first one is that there's, there's more interesting layers going on here with um, with most modern networks including the ResNet family uh, we the very first layer generally is a 7x7 seven seven cons or something similar um, which means we uh, and that's drive 2 right which means we throw away half the grid size straight away and so there's little opportunity to use the the fine detail because we never do any computation with it um, and so that's a bit of a problem for um, things like segmentation or super resolution models because the fine detail matters, right? We actually want to restore it. Um, and then the second problem is that um, the adaptive average pooling layer entirely throws away the geometry in the last few sections, which means that the rest of the model doesn't really have as much interest in kind of learning the geometry as it otherwise might. Um, and so therefore for things which are dependent on position, any kind of localization based approach to anything that requires generative modeling is going to be less effective. So one of the things I'm hoping you're hearing as I describe this is that probably none of the existing architectures are actually ideal. Um, we can invent a new one. And actually I just tried inventing a new one over the week, which was to take the, um, the VGG head and attach it to a ResNet backbone. Um, and interestingly, I found I actually got a slightly uh, better classifier than a normal ResNet, um, but it also was something with a little bit more useful information in it. It took, I don't know, five or 10% longer to train, but nothing worth worrying about. Um, yeah, I think, you know, maybe we can in ResNet replace this, as we've talked about briefly before, this uh, very early convolution with something more like an inception stem, which does a bit more computation. Uh, I think there's definitely room for some nice little tweaks to, to, to these architectures so that we can build some models which are maybe more versatile. You know, at the moment, people tend to build architectures that just do one thing. They don't really think, you know, what am I throwing away in terms of opportunity because that's... That's how publishing works. You know, you publish like I've got the state of the art in this one thing, rather than the I've, I've created something that's good at lots of things. So, um, so for these reasons, we're going to use VGG today, even though it's it's ancient and it's missing lots of great stuff. Um, one thing we are going to do though is use a um, slightly more modern version, which is a um, version of 
BGG where batch nom has been added after all the convolutions. And so in um, fast AI, actually, when you ask for a VGG network, you always get the batch norm one because that's basically always what you want. So this is actually our VGG with batch norm. Um, there's a 16 and a 19. The 19 is way bigger and heavier and doesn't really isn't really any better. So we, uh, no one really uses it. Uh, okay, so we're going to go from 72 by 72. Uh, LR is low resolution input. Uh, size low resolution. Uh, we're going to initially scale it up by times 2 with a batch size of 64 to get a 2 times 72, so 1 by 44 by 144 um, output. Um, so that's going to be our stage stage 1. Um, we'll create our own data set for this, and the data set, um, it, it's very worthwhile looking inside the fastai.dataset module and seeing what's there, because um, just about anything you'd want, we probably have something that's almost what you want. So in this case, I want a data set where my X's are images and my Y's are also images. So there's already a files data set we can inherit from where the X's are images. And then I just inherit from that, and I just copied and pasted the get X and turned that into get Y. So it just opens an image. So now I've got something where the X is an image and the Y is an image. And in both cases, what we're passing in is an array of file names. Um, I'm going to do some data augmentation. Um, obviously, with all of ImageNet, we don't really need it, but this is mainly here for you know anybody who's using smaller data sets to make the most of it. Um, random dihedral uh, is referring to um, every possible 90-degree rotation plus optional left-right flipping, so the, uh, the dihedral group of eight symmetries. Um, Normally we don't use this transformation for image net pictures because like you don't normally flip dogs upside down. Um, but in this case, we're not trying to classify whether it's a dog or a cat. We're just trying to keep the general structure of it. So actually, you know, uh, every possible flip is a reasonably sensible thing to do for this problem. Um, so create a validation set uh, in the usual way. Um, and you can see I'm kind of like using a few more slightly lower level functions. Generally speaking, uh, I just copy and paste them out of the fast AI source code to you know find the bits I want. So here's the bit which takes an array of um, validation set indexes and uh, one or more um, arrays of variables and um, simply splits, so in this case, this into a um, training and a validation set and this into a training as and a validate, sorry, yeah, and a training and a validation set to give us our X's and our Y's. Um, now, in this case, the, train, uh, the uh, X and the Y are the same. Our, our input image and our output image are the same. We're going to use transformations to make one of them lower resolution. So that's why these are the same, the same thing. Okay, so um, the next thing that we need to do is to create our transformations as per usual, and uh, we're going to use this transform y parameter like we did for bounding boxes, but rather than use transform type dot coordinate, um, we're going to use transform type dot pixel, and so um, that tells our um, transformations framework that your y values are, are images with normal pixels in them, and so anything you do to the x, you also need to do to the Y, do the same thing, okay? And you need to make sure any uh, data augmentation transforms you use have the same parameter as well, okay? Um, so you can see the possible transform types. You basically, you've got classification, which we're about to use for segmentation in the second half of today, coordinates, uh, no transformation at all, uh, or pixel. All right, so, um, once we've got a data set class and some um, X and Y training and validation sets, um, there's a handy little method called get data sets, which basically runs that constructor over all the different things that you have to return uh, all the data sets that you need in exactly the right format to pass, pass to a, a model data constructor, uh, constructor, in this case, the image data constructor. So we're kind of like going back under the covers of fast AI a little bit and building it up from scratch. And you know, in the next few weeks, 
this will all be wrapped up and refactored into something that you can do in a single step in fast AI. But the point of this class is to learn, you know, a bit about going under the covers. Um, so, uh, something we've briefly seen before is that when we take images in, we transform them, not just with data augmentation, but we also move the, um, the channels dimension up to the start. Uh, we uh, subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, whatever. Um, so if we want to be able to display those pictures that have come out of our data sets or data loaders, we need to denormalize them. And so the model data objects data set has a denorm uh, function that knows how to do that. So I'm just going to give that a short name um, for convenience. So now I'm going to create a function that can show an image from a data set. And uh, if you pass in something saying this is a normalized image, then we'll denorm it. Okay? So we can go ahead and have a look at that. You'll see here we've passed in size low res as our size for the transforms and size high res as this is something new, um, the size Y parameter. Okay, so the two bits are going to get different sizes. And so here you can see the two different resolutions of our X and our Y for a whole bunch of fish. Okay. Um, as you know, as per usual, plot.subplots um, to create our two plots, and then we can just use the different axes that came back to put stuff next to each other. Um, so uh, we can then uh, have a look at a few different versions of the data transformation, and there you can see them being flipped in all different directions. Okay, so let's create our model. So we're going to have an image coming in, small image coming in, and we want to have a big image coming out. Okay. And so we need to do some computation between those two to calculate what the big image would look like. And so essentially there's kind of two ways of doing that computation. We could first of all do some upsampling and then do a few stride one kind of layers to do lots of computation. Or we could first do lots of stride one layers to do all the computation, and then at the end do some upsampling. Um, we're going to pick the second approach because we want to do lots of computation on something smaller um, because it's much faster to do it that way. Uh, and also, like all that computation, we get to kind of leverage during the upsampling process. Um, so upsampling, um, we know a couple of possible ways to do that. We can use um, transposed uh, or fractionally strided convolutions, um, or we can use um, nearest neighbor upsampling, followed by a one by one conv. Um, and then uh, in, in the kind of do lots of computation section, uh, we could just have a whole bunch of three by three cons, right? But in this case particular, um, it seems likely that uh, ResNet blocks are going to be better because really the output and the input are very, very similar, right? So we really want a kind of a flow through path that allows as little fussing around as possible, except kind of the minimal amount necessary to do our super resolution. And so if we use ResNet blocks, then they have an identity path already, right? So like you could imagine the most simple version where it does like a, you know, um, bilinear sampling kind of approach or something. It could basically just go through identity blocks all the way through and then in the upsampling blocks just learn to take the averages of the inputs and get something that's like not too terrible. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to create... Um, something with five ResNet blocks, and then for each um, 2x scale-up we have to do, we'll have one upsampling block. Uh, so they're all going to consist of, um, obviously, as per usual, convolution layers, possibly with activation functions after many of them. Um, so I kind of like to put my standard convolution block into a function so I can refactor it more easily. Um, 
as per usual, I just won't worry about passing in padding and just calculate it directly as kernel size over two. Um, so one interesting thing about our little conf block here is that there's no batch nom, um, which is pretty unusual for uh, ResNet type models. Um, and the reason there's no batch norm is because I'm um, stealing ideas from this fantastic uh, recent paper which actually won a recent competition in um, super resolution um, performance. Um, and to see how good this paper is, here's kind of a previous state of the art, this SR ResNet, right? And what they've done here is they've zoomed way in to a, uh, an upsampled um, kind of net or, or fence, right? This is the original. And you can see in the, um, the kind of previous best approach, there's a whole lot of distortion and blurring going on, right? Whereas in their approach, it's, it's nearly perfect, right? So like it was a really big step up, this paper. Um, they call their model EDSR, Enhanced Deep Residual Networks. And they did um, two things uh, differently to um, the kind of previous standard approaches. One, was to take the ResNet blocks, this is a regular ResNet block, and throw away the batch norm. So why would they throw away the batch norm? Well, the reason they would throw away the batch norm is because batch norm changes stuff. And we want a nice straight through path that doesn't change stuff. Okay, so the idea basically here is like, hey, if you don't want to fiddle with the input more than you have to, then don't force it to have to calculate things like batch norm parameters. So throw away the batch norm. And um, the second trick we'll see shortly. All right, so here's a conf with no batch norm. Um, and so then we're going to create a um, residual block um, containing, as per usual, two convolutions. And as you see in their approach, they even they don't even have a ReLU after their second conf. Okay, so that's why I've only got activation on the first one. Um, so, a um, couple of interesting things here. One is that this idea of like having some kind of uh, uh, main ResNet path, like conv, ReLU, conv, and then turning that into a ReLU block by adding it back to the identity, it's something we do so often. I kind of factored it out into a tiny little module called res sequential, which simply takes a bunch of layers that you want to put into your um, residual path, um, turns that into a sequential model, uh, runs it, and then adds it back to the input. Right. So with this little module, we can now turn anything like conv, activation conv, into a ResNet block just by wrapping it in res sequential. Okay. Um, but that's not quite all I'm doing because, like, normally a res block just has that in its forward. But I've also got that. What's res scale? Res scale is the number 0 0.1. Why is it there? I'm not sure anybody quite knows. Um, but the short answer is that um, the guy who invented batch norm uh, also um, somewhat more recently did a paper in which he showed, uh, for I think the first time, the ability to train ImageNet in under an hour. And the way he did it was um, fire up lots and lots of machines and have them work in parallel to create really large batch sizes. Now generally when you increase the batch size by uh, order n, you also increase the learning rate by order n to go with it. So generally very large batch size training means very high learning rate training as well. And he found that with these very large batch sizes of like 8,000 plus, um, or even up to 32,000, that at the start of training, his activations would basically go straight to infinity. And a lot of other people have found that. We actually found that when we were competing in Dawnbench, both on the SciFar and the ImageNet competitions, that you know we really struggled to make the most of even the eight GPUs that we were trying to take advantage of because of these kind of um, challenges with these larger batch sizes and taking advantage of them. So something that uh, Christian found, this researcher, was that um, if he, in the ResNet blocks, if he multiplied them by some number smaller than one, something like 0.1 or 0.2, um, it really helped stabilize training at the start. And that's 
kind of weird because like mathematically it's kind of identical, right? Because obviously whatever I'm multiplying it by here, um, you know, I could just scale the weights by the opposite amount here and have the same number, right? So, but, but it's kind of like we're not dealing with abstract math, you know, we're dealing with like, you know, real optimization problems and different initializations and learning rates and whatever else. And so um, the problem of kind of weights disappearing off into infinity, I guess generally is really about the, the kind of the discrete and finite nature of computers in, in practice, partly. Um, and so often, yeah, these kind of little tricks can, can make the difference, right? So in this case, we're just kind of toning things down, um, based, at least based on our initial initialization. And so there are probably other ways to do this. Um, for example, one approach um, uh, from some folks at NVIDIA called LARS, L-A-R-S, which I briefly mentioned last week, uh, is an approach which uses discriminative learning rates uh, calculated in real time, um, basically looking at the ratio between the, the um, gradients and the activations um, uh, to scale learning rates by layer. Um, and so they found that they didn't need this trick to scale up, scale up the batch sizes a lot. Um, maybe a different initialization would, would be all that's necessary. Um, the reason I mention this is not so much because I think a lot of you are likely to want to train on massive clusters of computers, um, but rather that I think a lot of you want to train models quickly, and that means using high learning rates and ideally getting superconvergence. And uh, I think these kinds of tricks are the tricks that we'll need to be able to get superconvergence across more different architectures and so forth. Um, and, you know, other than Leslie Smith, um, no one else is really working on superconvergence other than some fast AI students nowadays. So these kind of things about how do we train at very, very high learning rates, we're going to be, have to be the ones who figure it out because as far as I can tell, nobody else cares uh, yet. Um, so, so I think, these, you know, the, looking at the literature around, you know, training ImageNet in one hour, or more recently there's now a train ImageNet in 15 minutes, these papers um, actually tell, I think, have some of the tricks to allow us to train things at high learning rates. And so here's one of them. And so, um, interestingly, other than the uh, train ImageNet in one hour paper, the only other place I've seen this mentioned was in this uh, EDSR paper. And it's really cool because, like, um, I don't know, people who win competitions, I just find them to be very pragmatic and well-read. You know, like, they actually have to get things to work. And so um, this paper describes an approach which actually worked better than anybody else's approach. And they did these pragmatic things, like throw away batch norm and um, uh, use this little scaling factor, which almost nobody else seems to know about, um, and stuff like that. Okay, so that's where the point one comes from. So basically our super resolution ResNet uh, is going to do a convolution to go from our three channels to 64 channels, just to richen up the space a little bit. Uh, then, oh, sorry, I've got actually eight, not five. Uh, eight lots of these res blocks. Um, we're just going to keep, remember, every one of these res blocks is um, stripe one, so the grid size doesn't change, the number of filters doesn't change, it's just 64 all the way through. Um, we'll do one more convolution, and then we'll do our upsampling by however much scale we asked for. Um, and then something I've added, which is a little idea, is just one batch norm here, because it kind of felt like it might be helpful just to scale the last layer. Um, and then finally a conv to go back to the three channels we want. Um, so you can see that's basically, here's lots and lots of computation and then a little bit of upsampling, um, just like we kind of described. Um, so the only other piece here then is, um, and, and also just to mention, you know, as you can see, as I'm tending to do now, this whole thing is done by creating just a, a list of layers and then at the end turning that into a sequential model, and so my forward function is as simple as can be. Um, so here's our upsampling. 
Um, and our upsampling is uh, a bit interesting because it is not doing either of these two things. So let's talk a bit about upsampling. Um, here's a picture from the paper, from not from the competition winning paper, but from this original paper. And so they're saying, hey, our approach is so much better, but look at their approach. It's got goddamn artifacts in it. Right? They just pop up everywhere, don't they? And so one of the reasons for this is that they use transposed convolutions, and we all know don't use transposed convolutions. Right? Um, so here are transposed convolutions. This is from this fantastic um, convolutional arithmetic paper that was uh, shown also in the Theano docs. If we're going from uh, the blue is the original image, so a three by three image up to a five by five image, right? Or it'd be six by six if we added a layer of padding. Um, then all a transpose convolution does is it uses a regular three by three conv, but it sticks white, you know, zero pixels between every pair of pixels, right? So that makes the input image bigger, and when we run this convolution arc over it, it therefore gives us a larger output. Right? But I mean, that's obviously stupid, because when we get here, for example, um, of the nine pixels coming in, eight of them are zero. So like we're just wasting a whole lot of computation. And then on the other hand, if we're slightly off over here, then four of our nine are non-zero. But yet we only have one filter, like one kernel to use, so it can't like change depending on how many zeros are coming in, so it has to kind of be suitable for both, and it's just not possible, right? So we end up with these artifacts. So one approach we've learned to make it a bit better is to um, not put white things here, but instead to copy this pixel's value to each of these three locations, right? So that's a, just a nearest neighbor upsampling. That's certainly a bit better, right? But it's still pretty crappy, because now still when we get to these nine here, four of them are exactly the same number. Right? And when we move across one, then now we've got, you know, uh, a, a different situation entirely, right? And so depending on where we are, so in particular if we're here, you know, there's going to be a lot less repetition. So again, we have this problem where there's like wasted computation and too much structure in the data and it's going to lead to artifacts again. So upsampling is better than transposed convolutions. It's, you know, better to copy them rather than replace them with zeros. Um, but it's still not quite good enough. So instead, we're going to do the pixel shuffle. So the pixel shuffle is an operation um, in this uh, sub-pixel convolutional neural network, and it's um, a little bit mind-bending, um, but it's kind of fascinating. And so we, we start with our input, we go through some convolutions to create some feature maps for a while until eventually we get to layer uh, n. I, uh, we get to this layer um, i minus one, which has n i minus one feature maps. Um, we're going to do another three by three conv, and our goal here is to go from a seven by seven grid cell. Uh, we're going to go a three by three upscaling, so we're going to go up to a twenty one by twenty one um, grid cell. So how do we? What's another way we could do that? Um, to make it simpler, let's just pick one face, just one filter. So we'll just take the topmost filter and just do a convolution over that just to see what happens. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a, um, a convolution where the kernel size uh, is, is the number of filters um, is um, nine times bigger than we, strictly speaking, need. So if we needed uh, 64 filters, we're actually going to do 64 times 9 filters. Why is that? Right? And so R, here R is the scale of factor, so 3. Right? So R squared, 3 squared is 9. So here are the 9 filters to cover one of these input layers, one of these input slices. Um, well, what we can do is we started with 7 by 7, and we turn it into 7 by 7 by 9, right? Well, the output that we want is equal to um, 7 times 3 
by 7 times 3. So in other words, there's an equal number of pixels here, or activations here, as there are activations here. So we can literally reshuffle these 7 by 7 by 9 activations to create this 7 by 3 by 7 by 3 um, map. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take one little kind of tube here, or the top left hand of each um, grid, and we're going to put the purple one up in the top left, and then the blue one, one to the right, and then the light blue one, one to the right of that, and then the slightly darker blue one in the middle of the far left, the green one in the middle, and so forth. So each of these nine uh, cells in the top left are going to end up in this little 3x3 three three section of our grid. And then we're going to take, you know, 2, 1, and take all of those nine, and move them to these 3x3 three three part of the grid, and so on and so forth, right? And so we're going to end up having every one of these 7x7x9 seven by seven by activations inside this 7x3x7x3 seven by three by seven by three image. So the first thing to realize is, yes, of course this works under some definition of works, because we have a learnable convolution here, and it's going to get some gradients, which is going to do the best job it can of filling in the correct activation such that this output is the thing we want. Right? So the first step is to realize there's nothing particularly magical here. You know, we can we can create any architecture we like, we can move things around anyhow we want to, and you know, our weights in the convolution will do their best to do what we asked. The real question is, is it a good idea? You know, is this an easier thing for it to do? You know, and a more flexible thing for it to do than the transposed convolution or the upsampling followed by one by one con. And the short answer is um, yes, it is. Right? And the reason it's better, um, in short, is that the convolution here is happening in the low resolution 7x7 seven seven space, which is quite efficient. Whereas if we first of all upsampled and then did our con, then our conf would be happening in the 21 by 21 space, which is a lot of computation, right? And furthermore, as we discussed, there's a lot of replication and redundancy in the nearest neighbor up sample version. Um, so they actually show in this paper, they actually, in fact, I think they have a follow-up technical note where they kind of provide some more mathematical details as to exactly what work is being done and show that the work really is more efficient this way. Okay. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Right? So we're going to have, uh, for our upsampling, we're going to have two steps. The first will be uh, a 3x3 three three conv with R squared times more channels than we originally wanted, and then a pixel shuffle operation which moves everything in each grid cell into the little R by R grids that are located throughout here. Okay, um, so um, here it is. It's one line of code, right? And so here's the conv from number of in to number of filters out times four because we're doing a scale two up sample, right? So two squared is four. So that's our convolution, and then here is our pixel shuffle. It's built into PyTorch. Pixel shuffle is the thing that moves each thing into its right spot. Um, so that will increase, will upsample by a scale factor of two, and so we need to do that log base two scale times. So if scale is four, then we have to do it two times to go two times two bigger. Okay. So that's what this up sample here does. Um, great. Guess what? That does not get rid of the checkerboard patterns. <laughs> we still have checkerboard patterns. So I'm sure in great fury and frustration, this same team from Twitter, I think this was back when they used to be at a startup called Magic Pony that Twitter bought, um, came back again with another paper saying, okay, this time we've got rid of the checkerboard. Okay, so 
So um, why do we still have, as you can see here, we still have a checkerboard, right? And so the reason we still have a checkerboard, even after doing this, is that when we randomly initialize this convolutional kernel at the start, it means that each of these nine pixels in this little 3x3 three three grid over here are going to be totally randomly different. But then the next set of three pixels will be randomly different to each other, but will be very similar to their corresponding pixel in the previous 3x3 three three section. So we're going to have repeating 3x3 three three things all the way across. And so then as we try to learn something better, it's starting from this like repeating 3x3 three three starting point which is not what we want, right? What we actually would want is for these 3x3 three three pixels to be the same to start with. So to make these 3x3 three three pixels the same, we would need to make these nine channels the same here, right, for each filter. And so the solution in this paper is very simple. It's that when we initialize this convolution, at the start, when we randomly initialize it, we don't totally randomly initialize it, we randomly initialize one of the R squared sets of channels, and then we copy that to the other R squared, so they're all the same. And that way, initially, each of these 3 by 3s will be the same. Um, and so that um, is called um, ICNR, okay. and that's what we're going to use in a moment. Um, so before we do, um, let's take a quick look. So we've got this super resolution ResNet, which just uh, does lots of computation, you know, with lots of ResNet blocks, and then it does some upsampling and gets our final three channels out. Um, and then to make life faster, uh, we're going to run this in parallel. Um, one reason we want to run it in parallel is because Dorado told us that he has six GPUs, and this is what his computer looks like right now. Um, and so I'm sure anybody who has more than one GPU has had this experience before. Um, so how do we get uh, how do we get these men working um, in uh, together? Um, all you need to do is to take your PyTorch module and wrap it with nn .data parallel. Okay. And once you've done that, it copies it to each of your GPUs and we'll automatically run it in parallel. Um, it scales pretty well to two GPUs, okay to three GPUs, um, better than nothing to four GPUs, and beyond that, performance starts to go backwards. Um, the, uh, by default, it'll copy it to all of your GPUs. Um, you can add an array of GPUs otherwise, um, uh, if you want to avoid getting in trouble. For example, I have to share our box with Yannette, and if I didn't put this here, then she would be yelling at me right now, or maybe, you know, boycotting my class. So uh, this is how you avoid getting into trouble with your net. Um, so one thing to be aware of here is that once you do this, it actually modifies your module. So if you now print out your module, let's say previously it was just an nn.sequential, now you'll find it's an nn.sequential embedded inside a, um, a, a module called module, right? And so in other words, if you um, save something which you had nn.data paralleled, and then try to load it back into something that you hadn't nn.data paralleled, it'll say it doesn't match up, because one of them is embedded inside this module attribute, and the other one isn't. It may also depend even on which GPU IDs you had, had it copied to. So two possible solutions. One is don't save the module M, but instead save the module attribute M dot module, because that's actually the, the non-data parallel bit. Or always put it on the same GPU IDs and, the, and use data parallel and load and save that every time. That's what I was using. Um, this will be an easy thing for me to fix automatically in FastAI, and I'll do it pretty soon, so it'll look for that module attribute and, and deal with it automatically, but for now, um, we, we have to do it manually. It's probably useful to know what's going on behind the scenes anyway. All right, so we've got our module. Um, you know, I find it'll run like 50 or 60% faster on a 
1080 Ti. Um, if you're running on Volta, it actually parallelizes uh, a bit better. Um, uh, there's a, there, there are much faster ways to parallel parallelize, but this is like a super super easy way. All right, so we create our learner in the usual way. Um, we could use MSC loss here, um, so that's just going to compare the pixels of the output to the pixels you know um, that we expected. Um, and we can run our learning rate finder, and we can train it for a while. And um, here's our input, and here's our output. And you can see that what we've managed to do is to train a very advanced residual convolutional network that's learned to blur things. Um, why is that? Well, because it's what we asked for. We said to minimize MSC loss, right? And MSC loss between pixels, really the best way to do that is just average the pixels, i.e. to blur it. So that's why pixel loss is no good. So we want to use our um, perceptual loss. So let's try perceptual loss, right? So with perceptual loss, we're basically going to take our VGG network, and just like we did last week, we're going to find the, um, the block index um, just before we get a max pool. Okay, so here are the ends of each, of each kind of block of the same grid size. And uh, if we just print them out as we'd expect, every one of those is a ReLU module. Um, and so in this case, these last two blocks are less interesting to us. The kind of the grid size there is small enough um, you know, kind of coarse enough that it's not as useful for super resolution. So we're just going to use the first three. And so just to save unnecessary computation, we're just going to use those first 23 layers of VGG. We'll throw away the, the rest. Um, we'll stick it on the GPU. Um, we're not going to be training this VGG model at all. We're just using it to compare activations. So we'll stick it in eval mode and we will set it to not trainable. Um, just like last week, we'll use a save features class to um, do a forward hook, which saves the output activations at each of those layers. Um, and so now we've got everything we need to create our perceptual loss, or as I call it here, feature loss class. Right? And so we're going to pass in a list of layer IDs, um, you know, the, the, the layers where we want the content loss to be calculated, an array of weights. Um, or a list of weights for each of those layers. Um, so we can just go through each of those layer IDs and create an object which is going to store, which is, you know, got the hook function, forward hook function to store the activations. And so in our forward, then, we can just go ahead and call the forward pass of our model with the target. So the target is the high res image we're trying to create. Right? And so the reason we do that is because that's going to then call that hook function and store in self dot save features the activations we want, right? Now we're going to need to do that for our um, uh, convnet output as well, right? So we need to clone these because otherwise the convnet output is going to go ahead and just clobber what we already had. Okay, so now we can do the same thing for the confnet output, which is the input to the loss function. Right? And so now we've got those two things. <coughs> we can zip them all together along with the weights. So we've got inputs, targets, and weights, and then we can do the L1 loss between the inputs and the targets and multiply by the layer weights. Um, the only other thing I do is I also grab the pixel loss, right? but I, I weight it down quite a bit. Right. And most people don't do this. I haven't seen papers that do this, but in my opinion, it's maybe a little bit better um, because you've got you know um, the perceptual content loss activation stuff. But you know, at the really finest level, it also cares about the individual pixels. Um, okay, so that's our loss function. Um, we create our super resolution ResNet, um, telling it how much to scale up by. Um, and then we're going to um, do our ICNR uh, initialization of that pixel shuffle convolution. Right? So there's really like, it's, this is very, very boring code. I actually stole it from, from somebody else. Um, like literally all it does is just say, okay, you've got some <coughs> weight tensor X 
that you want to initialize. Um, so we're going to treat it as if it had shape divided by, so number of features divided by uh, scale squared features in practice. So like, you know, uh, it, this might be two squared to be four because we actually want to copy, you know, we want to just keep one set of them and then copy them four times. So we divide it by four and we create something of that size and we initialize that with a default timing normal initialization and then we just make scale squared copies of it okay and the rest of it's just um, kind of moving axes around a little bit All right so that's going to return a new weight matrix where um, each um, each initialized sub kernel is repeated r squared or scale squared times um, so that details don't matter very much all that matters here is that I just looked through to find what was the actual layer, the conf layer just before the pixel shuffle, and stored it away. And then I called ICNR on its weight matrix to get my new weight matrix, and then I copied that new weight matrix back into that layer. Okay? So, as you can see, um, I, I went to quite a lot of trouble in this exercise to really try to implement all the best practices, right? And I kind of tend to do things a bit one extreme or the other. I show you like a really hacky version that only slightly works, or I go to the nth degree to make it work really well, right? And so this is a version where I'm claiming that this is pretty much a state-of-the-art implementation. It's a competition winning, uh, or at least my re-implementation of a competition winning approach. And the reason I'm doing that is because I think like this is one of those rare papers where they actually get a lot of the details right, and I kind of want you to get a feel of what does it feel like to get all the details right. And, you know, remember, getting the details right is the difference between this hideous blurry mess, you know, and this really pretty exquisite result. Um, okay, so, um, so we're now going to do data parallel on that again. Um, we're going to set our criterion to be feature loss using our VGG model, grab the first few blocks, and these are a sets of layer weights that I found worked pretty well. Um, do a learning rate finder, um, fit it for a while, um, and I fiddled around for a little while trying to kind of get some of these details uh, right. Um, but uh, here's the my favorite part of the paper. Um, is what happens next now that we've done it for um, scale equals two progressive resizing All right so progressive resizing is the trick that let us get the best single computer result for image net training on dawn bench it's this idea of starting small gradually making it bigger i only know of two papers that have used this idea one is the progressive resizing of gans paper which allows training of very <coughs> high resolution GANs, and the other one is the EDSR paper. And the cool thing about progressive resizing is not only are your earlier epochs, assuming you've got two by two smaller, four times faster, um, you can also make the batch size maybe three or four times bigger, um, but more importantly, they're going to generalize better because you're feeding your model different size images during training, right? So we were able to train in like half as many epochs for ImageNet as most people. Uh, so our epochs were faster and there were fewer of them. So progressive resizing is something that, um, you know, particularly if you're training from scratch, I'm not so sure if it's useful for fine tuning transfer learning, but if you're training from scratch, you probably want to do nearly all the time. So the next step is to go all the way back to the top, right, and change to four scale, 32 batch size, right? Like restart, so I saved the model before I do that, go back. And that's why there's a little bit of um, uh, fussing around in here with reloading. Because what I needed to do now is I needed to load my saved model back in, but there's a slight issue, which is I now have one more upsampling layer than I used to have. To go from two by two to four by four, um, my little uh, my little loop here 
is now looping through twice, not once, and therefore it's added an extra con and an extra pixel shuffle. So how am I going to load in weights for a different network? And the answer is that I use a very handy thing in PyTorch, which is if I call the this is what this is uh, basically what um, learn dot load calls behind the scenes um, load state dict. If I pass this parameter strict equals false, um, if I pass in this parameter strict equals false, um, then it says okay if you can't fill in all of the layers, just fill in the layers you can. So after loading the model back in this way, we're going to end up with something where it's loaded in all the layers that it can, and the, the, that one com layer that's new is going to be randomly initialized. Right? And so then I freeze all my layers, and then unfreeze that upsampling part, right? and then use ICNR on my newly added um, extra layer, right? and then I can go ahead and learn again. Um, and so then the rest is the same. Yeah. So if you're trying to replicate this, don't just run this top to bottom. Okay, realize it involves a bit of jumping around. Okay, um, and yeah, the longer you train, the better it gets. Um, I ended up training it for about 10 hours, but you'll still get very good results much more quickly if you're less patient. Um, and so we can try it out, and here is the result. Here is my pixelated bird, and look here, it's like totally random -y pixels, and here's the upsampled version. It's like, it's literally invented color coloration, but it figured out what kind of bird it is, right? And it knows what these feathers are meant to look like. And so it has imagined a set of feathers which are compatible with these exact pixels, which is like genius. Like, same here, right? There's no way you can tell what these blue dots are meant to represent. But if you know that this kind of bird has an array of feathers here, you know that's what they must be, right? And then you can figure out where the feathers would have to be such that when they were pixelated they would end up in these spots. Right? So it's like literally reverse engineered, like given its knowledge of this exact species of bird, how it would have to have looked to create this output. And so this is like so amazing. It, it also knows from all the kind of signs around it that this area here um, was was almost certainly blurred out. So it's actually reconstructed blurred vegetation. Um, and you know if it if it hadn't have done all of those things, it wouldn't have got such a good loss function, right? Because in the end, it had to match you know, the the activations saying like, oh, there's a feather over here, and it's kind of fluffy looking, and it's, you know, in this direction, and all that. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of Super Resolution. Um, don't forget to check out the uh, Ask Jeremy Anything thread, and we will do some Ask Jeremy Anything after the break. Let's see you back here at um, quarter to eight. Okay, so we are going to do Ask Jeremy Anything. Rachel will tell me the most voted up of your questions. Yes, Rachel. What are the future... Uh, let me turn this up. What are the future plans for Fast AI in this course? Will there be a part three? If there is a part three, I would really love to take it. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I'm not quite sure. I, it's always hard to guess. Um, I hope there'll be some kind of follow-up. Last year, after part two, one of the students um, started up a, a weekly book club going through the Ian Goodfellow Deep Learning book, and Ian actually came in and presented quite a few of the chapters and other people. Like there was somebody, an expert, who presented every chapter. That was really that was like a really cool part three. Um, to a large extent, it'll depend on um, on you, the community, to 
come up with ideas and help make them happen. And um, yeah, and I'm definitely keen to to help. I've got a bunch of ideas, but I'm nervous about saying them because I'm not sure which ones will happen and which ones won't. But uh, the more support I have in making things happen that you want to happen from you, the more likely they are to happen. What was your experience like starting down the path of entrepreneurship? Have you always been an entrepreneur? Or did you start at a start out at a big company and transition to a startup? Did you go from academia to startups or startups to academia? No, I was definitely not in academia. I'm totally a fake academic. Um, I, I, I started at McKinsey and Company, which is a strategy firm when I was 18, um, uh, which meant I couldn't really go to university, so I didn't really turn up. And then, yeah, I spent eight years in business helping really big companies on strategic questions. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, planned to only spend two years at McKinsey. Um, only thing I really regret in my life was not sticking to that plan and wasting eight years instead. Um, so two years would have been perfect. Um, but yeah, then I went into entrepreneurship, started two companies in Australia. And um, the best part about that was that I didn't get any funding. Um, so all the money that I made was mine, all the decisions were mine and my, you know, and my partners. Um, you know, I focused entirely on, on profit and product and customer and service. Um, uh, whereas I find in San Francisco, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad I came here. And uh, so um, uh, the two of us from, you know, came here for, for Kaggle, um, um, Anthony and I, and raised, you know, a ridiculous amount of money, $11 million for this really new company. That was really interesting, but uh, it's also really distracting, you know, trying to worry about scaling and VCs wanting to see what your business development plans are and also just not having any real need to actually make a profit. And yeah, um, so I had a bit of the same problem at Analytic um, where I, again, raised a lot of money, uh, it's like $15 million pretty quickly um, and yeah, a lot of distractions. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, trying to bootstrap your own company uh, and focus on making money by selling something at a, pro at, a, at, a, at a profit and then, you know, plowing that back into the company, um, it worked really well, right? Because within like five years, um, you know, we were making a profit from three months in and within five years we were making, you know, enough of a profit not just to pay all of us in their own wages but also to see my bank account growing and after 10 years sold it for a big chunk of money not enough that a VC would be excited but enough that I didn't have to worry about money again you know um, so I think yeah bootstrapping a company is something which people in the Bay Area at least don't seem to appreciate how good an idea that is if you were 25 years old today and still know what you know, where would you be looking to use AI? What are you working on right now or looking to work on in the next two years? You should ignore the last part of that. I won't even answer it. It doesn't matter where I'm looking. Like the, the, what you should do is leverage your knowledge about your domain. So like one of the main reasons we do this is to get people who have backgrounds in whatever, recruiting, you know, uh, oil field surveys, um, journalism, activism, whatever, right? And solve your problems. Um, it'll be really obvious to you what your problems are and it'll be really obvious to you what data you have and where to find it. Um, and those are all the bits that for everybody else it's really hard. So people who start out with like, oh, I know deep learning, now I'll go and find something to apply it to, basically never succeed, uh, whereas people who are like, oh, I've been spending 25 years doing specialized recruiting for legal firms, and I know that the key issue is this thing, and I know that this piece of data totally solves it, and so I'm just going to do that now, and I already know who to call to actually start selling it to, you know, they're the ones who who tend to win. So, um, yeah, and, 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 you know, if you if you've done nothing but, like, academic stuff, then it's more maybe about your your hobbies and interests, you know, so uh, everybody has hobbies. Um, the main thing I would say is tr please don't 
focus on building tools for data scientists to use or for software engineers to use because every data scientist knows about the market of data scientists whereas only you know about the market for you know um, analyzing oil survey well logs or you know uh, understanding uh, audiology studies or whatever it is that you do. Given what you've shown us about applying transfer learning from image recognition to NLP, there looks to be a lot of value in paying attention to all of the developments that happen across the whole machine learning field, and that if you were to focus in one area, you might miss out on some great advances in other concentrations. How do you stay aware of all the advancements across the field while still having time to dig in deep to your specific domains? Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that's kind of the message of this course. So one of the key messages of this course, yeah, is like, Lots of good work's being done in different places, and people are so specialized, most people don't know about it. Like, if I can get state-of-the-art results in NLP within six months of starting to look at NLP, then I think that says more about NLP than it does about me, frankly. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of like the entrepreneurship thing. It's like you, you, you pick the, the areas that you see that you know about and kind of transfer stuff like, oh, we could use deep learning to solve this problem, or... In this case, like we could use, you know, um, this idea of computer vision to solve that problem. Um, so things like trans you know, I mean, transfer learning, I'm sure there's like a thousand things, opportunities for you to do in other fields to do what Sebastian and I did in NLP with NLP classification. Uh, so the short answer to your question is the way to stay ahead of what's going on would be to follow my feed of Twitter favorites. <laughs> and my approach is to... Um, follow lots and lots of people on Twitter and put them into the Twitter favorites for you. Like literally, I every time I come across something interesting, I click favorite. And uh, there are two reasons I do it. The first is that when the next course comes along, I go through my favorites to find which things I want to study. And the second is so that, you know, uh, you can do the same thing. Um, and then, you know, which do you go deep into? It almost doesn't matter. Like, I find every time I look at something, it turns out to be super interesting and important. So I'll just, like, pick something which is, like, um, you feel like solving that problem would be actually useful for some reason, and it doesn't seem to be very popular, which is kind of the opposite of what everybody else does. Everybody else works on the problems which everybody else is already working on because they're the ones that seem popular and, I don't know, I can't quite understand this chain of thinking, but it seems to be very common. Is deep learning an overkill to use on tabular data? When is it better to use deep learning instead of machine learning on tabular data? Is that a real question, or did you just put that there <laughs> so that I would point out that Rachel Thomas just wrote an article? <laughs> uh, so, um, Yes, so Rachel's just written about this, and uh, and um, uh, Rachel and I spent a long time talking about it, and the short answer is we think it's great to use deep learning on tabular data. Um, actually, of all the rich, complex, important, and interesting things that appear in Rachel's Twitter stream covering uh, everything from uh, the genocide of the Rohingya uh, through to the latest ethics violations in AI companies, um, the one by far that got the most uh, attention and engagement from the community was her question about, is it called tabular data or structured data? So, um, yeah, ask computer people uh, how to name things and you'll get plenty of interest. Um, yeah, and there's some, some really good um, links here to stuff from Instacart and Pinterest and other folks who have done some uh, good work in this area. Any of you that went to the Data Institute conference will have seen Jeremy Stanley's presentation about the really cool work they did at Instacart. Um, yes, Rachel? So I, I relied heavily on lessons three and four from part one in writing this post. So yes. much of it may be familiar to you. Yeah. Um, Rachel asked me during the post, like, how to tell whether it, you should use a, a decision tree ensemble like GBM or Random Forest or, or a neural net, and my answer is I still don't know. Um, nobody, to my, nobody I'm aware of has done that research in any particularly meaningful way, um, so there's a question to be answered there. I guess um, 
my approach has been to try to make both of those things as accessible as possible through the fast AI library so you can try them both to both and see what works that's that's what I do oh and that was it for the top voted questions okay, thank you okay so um, just quickly to go from um, super resolution to style transfer is kind of uh, oh, sorry. I think I missed the one on reinforcement learning. Um, reinforcement learning popularity has been on a gradual rise in the recent past. Um, what's your take on reinforcement learning? Would fast AI consider covering some ground in popular RL techniques in the future? Um, I'm still not a believer in reinforcement learning. Um, I think it's a an interesting problem to solve but it's not at all clear that we have a good way of solving this problem. So the problem, it really is the delayed credit problem. So, you know, I want to learn to play Pong, I move up or down, and three minutes later I find out whether I won the game of Pong, um, which actions I took were actually useful. And so to me, the idea of calculating the gradients of those inputs with respect, you know, the out, sorry, the gradients of the output with respect to those inputs, the, the credit is so delayed that those derivatives don't seem very interesting. Um, and there's been, you know, and I've kind of been, I've, I get this question quite regularly in every one of these four courses so far. I've always said the same thing. Um, I'm, I'm rather pleased that finally recently there's been some results showing that actually basically random search often does better than reinforcement learning. Um, so basically what's happened is um, very well-funded companies with vast amounts of computational power throw all of it at reinforcement learning problems and get good results and people then say oh it's because of the reinforcement learning rather than the vast amounts of compute power or um, they use extremely uh, thoughtful and clever algorithms like a combination of convolutional neural nets and Monte Carlo tree search like they did with uh, the AlphaGo stuff to get great results and people incorrectly say, oh, that's because of reinforcement learning when it wasn't really reinforcement learning at all. So um, I'm very interested like in solving these kind of more generic optimization type problems rather than just prediction problems. And that's what these delayed credit problems tend to look like. Um, but I, I don't think we've yet got good enough best practices that I have anything on ready to teach and say like I'm going to teach you this thing because I think it's still going to be useful next year um, so I'll, we'll keep watching and um, yeah see see what happens okay um, so we're going to now uh, turn the uh, super resolution network basically into a um, style transfer network and we'll do this pretty quickly um, we, we basically already have something so here's my input image, and I'm going to have some loss function, um, and I've got some uh, neural net again. Um, so instead of a neural net that does a whole lot of compute and then does upsampling at the end, um, our input this time is just as big as our output. So we're going to do some downsampling first, and then our compute, and then our upsampling. Okay. So that's the first change we're going to make is we're going to add some downsampling, uh, so some stride two convolution layers to the front of our network. Um, the second is rather than just comparing um, y, c, and x are the same thing here, right? So we're going to basically say uh, our input image should look like itself um, by the end. And so specifically, we're going to compare it by chucking it through VGG and comparing it at one of the content at one of the um, activation layers. And then its style should look like some um, painting, um, which we'll do just like we did with the Gaddy's approach by looking at the gram matrix correspondence at a number of layers. Um, so that's basically it. And so that, um, that ought to be super straightforward. Um, it's really just combining two things we've already done. Um, and so all this code at the start is identical, except we don't have high res and low res. We just have one size, 256. Um, all this is the same. Um, my model is the same. Um, one thing I did here is I I made, uh, I did not do any kind of fancy best practices for this one at all. Um, partly because there doesn't seem to be any, like there's been very little follow-up 
um, in this approach uh, compared to this, uh, the super resolution stuff. And we'll talk about why in a moment. Um, so you'll see this is like much more uh, normal looking. You know, I've got batch norm layers. Um, I uh, don't have uh, the, the scaling factor here. Um, you know, I don't have a pixel shuffle. It's just using a normal upsampling followed by one by one cons, blah, blah, blah. Right? So it's kind of, it's just more normal. Um, one thing they mentioned in the paper is they had a lot of problems with um, um, zero padding creating artifacts. And the way they solved that was by adding 40 pixels of reflection padding at the start. Um, so I did the same thing. And then they used um, zero padding in their convolutions in their res blocks. Now, if you've got zero padding in your convolution in your res blocks, then that means that your the two parts of your ResNet won't add up anymore um, because you've lost a pixel from each side on each of your two convolutions. So my um, my res sequential has become res sequential center and I've removed the last two pixels on each side of those grid cells. Okay. So other than that, this is basically the same as what we had um, before. So then we can bring in our starry night picture, uh, we can resize it, um, we can throw it through our transformations. Um, just to make the method a little bit easier for my brain to handle, I took my uh, transformation image, which after transform, uh, transform style image, which after transformations is 3 by 256 by 256, and I made a mini batch. My batch size is 24. 24 copies of it. Now it just makes it a little bit easier to do the, the, the kind of batch arithmetic um, without worrying about some of the broadcasting. They're not really 24 copies. I used np.broadcast to, to um, basically uh, fake 24 copies. Um, okay, so just like before, we create our VGG, grab the last block. Um, this time we're going to use um, all of these layers. Um, so we keep everything up to the 43rd layer. Um, and so now our combined loss is going to add together a content loss for the third block plus the gram loss for all of our blocks with different weights. And so the gram loss, and again, kind of going back to everything being as like normal as possible, I've gone back to using MSE here. Um, basically what happened is I had a lot of trouble getting this to train properly, so I gradually removed trick after trick and eventually just went, okay, I'm just going to make it as, as bland as possible. Um, last week's gram matrix um, was wrong, by the way. It only worked for a batch size of one, and we only had a batch size of one, so that was fine. Um, I was using um, matrix multiply, um, which meant that every batch was be being compared to every other batch. Um, you actually need to use batch matrix multiply, which does a matrix multiply per batch. Okay. Um, so that's something to be aware of there. Okay, so um, so I've got my gram matrices, I do my MSC loss between the gram matrices, I weight them, I style weights. Um, so I create that ResNet, so I create my style, my combined loss, passing in the VGG network, passing in the block IDs, passing in the transformed um, starry night image. And so you'll see at the very start here, I do a forward pass through my VGG model with that starry night image in order that I can save the features for it. Right? Now notice, um, it's really important now that I don't do any data augmentation because I've saved the style features for a particular, uh, you know, non-augmented version. Um, and so if I augmented it, it might make some minor problems. Um, but that's fine because I've got all of ImageNet to deal with. I don't really need to do data augmentation um, anyway. Okay, uh, so I've got my loss function and I can go ahead and fit and there's really nothing clever here at all. At the end um, I have my sum layers equals false so I can see what each part looks like and see that they're reasonably balanced and I can finally pop it out. Um, so I mentioned that should be pretty easy um, and yet it took me about four days um, because it just, I just found this incredibly fiddly to actually get it to work. So like when I finally got up in the morning and I said to Rachel, guess what, 
the train correctly, Rachel was like, I never thought that was going to happen. Um, it just it just looked awful all the time. And it was really about getting the exact right mix of content loss versus style loss and the mix of the layers of the style loss. And the, the worst part was it takes a really long time to train the damn CNN. And I don't didn't really know how long to train it before before I decided it wasn't doing well. Like, should I just train it for longer or what? Um, and I don't know, all the little details didn't seem to like slightly change it, but just like it would totally fall apart all the time. So um, I kind of mentioned this um, partly to say like, just remember the final answer you see here is after me driving myself crazy all week of it nearly always not working until finally at the last minute it finally does. Um, for, even for things which just seem like they couldn't possibly be difficult because they're just combining two things we already have working. Um, the other is like to be careful about how we interpret what authors claim. Um, yeah, so it, it was so fiddly getting this style transfer to work. And like after doing it, it left me thinking, why did I bother? Because now I've got something that takes hours to create a network that can turn any kind of photo into one specific style. It's, it just seems very unlikely I would want that for anything. Like about the only reason I could think that being useful would be to like do some arty stuff on a video where I wanted to turn every frame into some style. Like it's an incredibly niche thing to want to do. But you know, when I looked at the paper, the, you know, their tables saying like, oh, we're a thousand times faster than the Gaddy's approach, which is like, it's just such an obviously meaningless thing to say and such an incredibly kind of misleading thing to say because it ignores all the hours of training for each individual style. And I, I don't know, I find this frustrating because like a, groups like this Stanford group clearly know better or ought to know better, but still, I guess the academic community kind of encourages people to make these ridiculously grand claims. And it also completely ignores this incredibly sensitive, fiddly training process. Um, so, you know, this paper was just so well accepted when it came out. You know, I remember everybody getting on Twitter and being like, wow, you know, these Stanford people have found this way of doing style transfer a thousand times faster. And clearly, you know, all the people saying this were like all like top researchers in the field, but clearly like none of them actually understood it because nobody said, you know, I don't see why this is remotely useful. And also I tried it and it was incredibly fiddly to get it to work. And so it's not until like, what is this now? Like 18 months later or something that I finally coming back to it and kind of thinking like, wait a minute, this is kind of stupid. And so, so this is the answer I think to the question of like, well, why haven't people done follow-ups on this to like create really amazing best practices and better approaches like with the super resolution part of the paper. And I think the answer is because it's done. Um, so I think um, this part of the paper is clearly not done, you know, and it's been improved and improved and improved. And now we have great super resolution. And I think we can derive from that great noise reduction, great colorization, great, um, you know, slant removal, uh, uh, great uh, uh, interactive artifact removal, whatever else. Um, so I think... Um, there's a lot of really cool techniques here. And it's also leveraging a lot of stuff that we've been learning and getting better and better at. Um, okay, so then finally, let's talk about um, segmentation. This is from the famous um, CAMVID uh, data set, which is in the classic example of an academic segmentation data set. And basically, you can see what we do is we start with a, a picture. There are actually video frames in this data set, like here. And um, we construct, uh, we, we have some labels where um, they're not actually colors. They're, each one has an ID, and the IDs are mapped to colors. So like red might be one, purple might be two, light pink might be 
um, three. And so all the buildings, you know, are one class, or the cars are another class, all the people are another class, all the road is another class. And so what we're actually doing here is multi-class classification for every pixel. Okay? And so you can see sometimes that multi-class classification really is quite tricky. There's, you know, like, a, like these branches. Um, although sometimes the labels are really not that great. You know, this is very coarse, um, as you can see. Um, so here are traffic lights and so forth. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to do this is a segmentation. And so it's a lot like um, bounding boxes, right? But, um, you know, rather than just finding, you know, a box around each thing, we're actually going to label every single pixel with its class. And really that's actually a lot easier um, because it fits our CNN style so nicely that we basically, we can create any CNN where the output is an N by M grid um, containing the integers from zero to C where there are C categories. And then we can use cross entropy loss with a softmax activation and we're done, right? So like I could actually stop the class there and you can go and use exactly the approaches you've learned in like lessons one and two and you'll get a perfectly okay result, right? So the first thing to say is like, this is not actually a terribly hard thing to do, but we're gonna try and do it really well. Um, and so um, let's start by doing it the really simple way, right? And we're going to use the Kaggle Carvana competition. So you Google Kaggle Carvana to find it. You can download it with the Kaggle API as per usual. Um, and basically there's a train folder containing a bunch of images, which is the independent variable, and a train masks folder that contains the dependent variable, and they look like this. Here's, the, here's one of the independent variable. And here's one of the dependent variable. Okay. So in this case, uh, just like cats and dogs, we're going simple. Rather than doing multi-class classification, we're gonna do binary classification, but of course, multi-class is just the more general version, you know, categorical cross entropy or binary cross entropy. Okay, so there's no differences conceptually. So we've got, uh, this is just, you know, zeros and ones, um, where else this is a regular image. So um, in order to do this well, um, it would really help to know what cars look like, right? Because, you know, really what we just want to do is, is figure out this is a car and this is orientation and then color, you know, put white pixels where we expect the car to be based on the picture and our understanding of what cars look like. Um, the uh, original data set came with these CSV files as well. I don't really use them for very much um, other than getting the list of images from them. Um, um, each, uh, each image uh, after the car ID has a 0, 1, 0, 2, et cetera of which I've printed out all 16 of them for one car. And as you can see, basically those numbers are the 16 orientations of one car. Um, so there that is. I, uh, I don't think anybody in this competition actually used this uh, orientation information. I believe they all kept the car's images, just treated them separately. Um, these images are pretty big, like over a thousand by a thousand in size. Um, and just uh, opening the JPEGs and uh, resizing them is slow. Um, so I um, process them all. Also, uh, OpenCV can't handle uh, GIF files, so I converted them. Yes, Rachel. The question, how would somebody get these masks for training initially? Mechanical Turk or something? Yeah. Yeah, just a lot of boring work. Um, you know, probably some tools that help you with a bit of edge snapping and stuff so that the human can kind of do it roughly and then just fine tune the bits it gets wrong. Um, yeah, look, these kinds of labels are expensive, you know. And so one of the things I really want to work on is um, deep learning enhanced interactive labeling tools because, you know, that's clearly something that would help a lot of people. Um, yeah, so I've got a little section here that you can run if you want to. You probably want to, which uh, converts the GIFs into PNGs. Um, so just open it up with a PIL and then save it as PNG because uh, OpenCV doesn't have GIF support. 
Um, and as per usual for this kind of stuff, I do it with a thread pool so I can take advantage of parallel processing. And then also um, create a separate directory, train-128 and train masks-128, which contains the 128 by 128 resized versions of them. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that keeps you sane if you do it early in the process. So anytime you get a new data set, you know, seriously think about creating a, you know, smaller version to make life fast. Um, anytime you find yourself waiting on your computer, you know, try and think of a way to create a, a smaller version. Um, so yeah, after you grab it from Kaggle, you probably want to run this stuff. Go away, have lunch, come back, and when you're done, you'll have these smaller directories, which we're going to use here, 128 by 128 pixel versions to start with. Um, so here's a cool trick. If you um, use the same axis object to plot an image twice, and the second time you use alpha, which as you might know means transparency in the computer vision world, then uh, you can actually plot the mask over the top of the photo. And so there, here's a nice way to see all the masks on top of the photos for all of the cars in um, one group. Uh, this is the same match files data set we've seen twice already. Um, this is all the same code we're used to. And here's something important though. If we had something that was uh, in the training set good at this image, and then the validation had that image, that would kind of be cheating, because it's the same car. So we use um, a contiguous set of car IDs, and since each set is a set of 16, uh, we make sure that it's uh, evenly divisible by 16, um, so we make sure that our validation set contains different car IDs to our training set. Um, this is the kind of stuff which you've got to be careful of. On Kaggle, it's not so bad. You'll know about it because you'll submit your result and you'll get a very different result on your leaderboard compared to your um, validation set. Um, but in the real world, you won't know until you put it in production and send your company bankrupt and lose your job. Um, so you might want to think carefully about your validation set in that case. Um, so here we're going to use transform type dot classification. Um, it's basically the same as transform type dot pixel, but if you think about it, we with the pixel version, if we rotate a little bit, then we probably want to like average the pixels in between the two. But for classification, obviously we we don't. We use nearest neighbor. So there's a slight difference there. Also for classification, you know, lighting doesn't kick in, normalization doesn't kick in to the dependent variable. Um, um, okay, they're already square images, so we don't have to do any cropping. Um, so here you can see different versions of the augmented, you know, they're moving around a bit and they're rotating a bit and so forth. Um, yeah, I get a lot of questions kind of like during uh, our study group and stuff about like how do I debug things and fix things that aren't working and like I, I never have a great answer other than that, like every time I fix a problem, it's because of stuff like this that I do all the time. You know, I just always print out everything as I go. And then the one thing that I screw up always turns out to be the one thing that I forgot to check along the way. So um, yeah, the more of this kind of thing you can do, the better. If you're not looking at all of your intermediate results, um, you're going to have troubles. Okay. Um, so given that we want something that knows what cars look like, we probably want to start with a pre-trained ImageNet network. Um, so uh, we're going to start with ResNet 34. And so with ConvNet Builder, we can grab our ResNet 34 and we can add a custom head. And so the custom head is going to be something that upsamples a bunch of times. And we're going to do things really dumb for now, which is we're just going to do conv transpose 2D uh, batch norm value. Okay, um, and so here's like, this is what I'm saying, right? You could, any of you could have built this without looking at any of this notebook, or at least like you have the information from previous classes. There's nothing new at all, okay? And so uh, at the very end, we have uh, a single uh, filter, okay? And now that's gonna give us something which is batch size by one, by 128 by 128, but we want something which is batch size by 128 by 128, so we have to remove that unit axis. So I've got a, a lambda layer here, 
lambda layers are incredibly helpful, right? Because without the lambda layer here, which is simply removing that unit axis by just indexing into it at zero, without the lambda layer, I would have to have created a custom class with a custom forward method and so forth. But by creating a lambda layer that does like the one custom bit, I can now just chuck it in the sequential, and so that just makes life easier. So the PyTorch people are kind of snooty about this approach. Lambda layer is actually something that's part of the FastAI library, not part of the PyTorch library. And like literally people on the PyTorch uh, discussion board are like, yes, we could give people this. Yes, it is only a single line of code, but then it would like encourage them to use sequential too often. <laughs> So um, there you go. Okay. So um, so this is our custom head, right? So we're going to have a resident 34 that goes down sample and then a really simple custom head that very quickly up samples. And uh, that hopefully will do something. And uh, we're going to use accuracy with a threshold of 0.5 to print out metrics. And so after a few epochs, we've got 96% accurate. Okay. So is that good? Is 96% accurate good? And hopefully the answer to your quest, that question is, it depends. What's it for? Right? And the answer is, Kavana wanted this because they wanted to be able to take um, their uh, car images and cut them out and paste them on you know, exotic Monte Carlo backgrounds or whatever. That's Monte Carlo, the place, not the simulation. <laughs> um, so... Um, to do that, you need a really good mask, right? You don't want to, like, leave the rear view mirrors behind or, like, you know, kind of have one wheel missing or include a little bit of background or something. That would look stupid. So you would need something very good. So only having 96% of the pixels correct doesn't sound great, right? But we won't really know until we look at it. So let's look at it. So there's the correct version that we want to cut out, that's the 96% accurate version. <laughs> okay, so like, when you look at it, you realize, oh yeah, getting 90%, 96% of the pixels accurate is actually easy because like all the outside bit's not car and all the inside bit is car and really the only interesting bit is the edge. Okay, so we need to do better. Um, so let's unfreeze, because all we've done so far is train the custom head. Okay, and let's do more. And so after a bit more, we've got 99.1%. Okay, so is that good? I don't know. Let's take a look. And so actually, no, it's totally missed the rear view vision mirror here and missed a lot of it here. And it's clearly got an edge wrong here. And these things are totally going to matter when we try to cut it out. So it's still not good enough. So let's try upscaling. And the nice thing is that when we upscale to 512 by 512, make sure you decrease the batch size because you'll run out of memory. Um, you know, here's the true ones. Um, it's quite a lot more, um, this is all identical, uh, it's quite a lot more information there for it to go on. So our accuracy increases to 99.4%, uh, and things keep getting better. But we've still got quite a few little black blocky bits. So let's go to 124 by 124, down to batch size of 4. So this is pretty high res now. And train a bit more. 99.6. 99.8. And so now, if we look at the masks, they're actually looking not bad. Okay, that's looking pretty good. Right? So um, can we do better? And the answer is, um, yes, we can. Um, so we're moving from the Carvana notebook to the Carvana Unet notebook now. And the UNET network is quite magnificent, right? You see, with that previous approach, our pre-trained ImageNet network was being squished down all the way down to 7x7 seven seven, and then expanded out all the way back up to, you know, well, it's 224, it would go to 7x7, seven seven, but 1024 is going quite a bit bigger. And then expanded out again all this way, which means it has to somehow store all the information about the much bigger version in the small version. Right? And actually, most of the information about the bigger version was really in the original picture anyway. Right? So it doesn't seem like a great approach, this squishing and unsquishing. So the unit idea comes from this fantastic paper where like, it was literally invented in this um, 
you know, very domain-specific area of biomedical image segmentation. But in fact, basically every Kaggle winner in, in, in anything even vaguely related to segmentation has ended up using UNET. It's one of these things that like everybody in Kaggle knows is the best practice, but in more of a, academic circles, like even now, this has been around for a couple of years at least, a lot of people still don't realize that it's like this is by far the best approach. Um, and here's the basic idea. Here's the downward path, right, where we basically start um, um, uh, start at 572 by 532 in this case, and then kind of halve the grid size, halve the grid size, halve the grid size, half the grid size, right? And then here's the upward path where we double the grid size, double, 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 right? Um, but the uh, thing that we also do is we take you know, at every point where we've halved the grid size, we actually copy those activations over to the upward path and, and concatenate them together. Um, and so you can see here these um, red blobs are max pooling operations, the green blobs are um, upward sampling, uh, and then these gray bits here are copying, right? And so we copy and concat. So basically, in other words, the input image after a couple of comms is copied over to the output, concatenated together, and so now we get to use all of the information that's gone through all the down and all the up, plus also a slightly modified version of the input pixels, right? And a slightly modified version of one thing down from the input pixels, because they came out through here, right? So we have like all of the richness of going all the way down and up, but also like a slightly less coarse version and a slightly less coarse version and then this really kind of simple version and they can all be combined together, right? And so that's UNIT, such a cool idea. Um, so here we are in the, in the um, Carvana UNIT notebook, all this is the same code as before. Um, and um, at the start I've got a um, simple upsample version just to kind of show you again the, the non-unit version. Um, this time I'm going to add in something called the DICE metric. DICE is very similar, as you see, to Jacquard or I over U. It's just a minor difference. It's basically uh, intersection over union um, with a minor tweak. And the reason we're going to use DICE is um, that's the metric that the Kaggle competition used. And it's kind of, um, it's a little bit harder to get a high dice score than a high accuracy because it's really looking at like what the overlap of the correct pixels are with, with your pixels. Um, but it's pretty similar. So in the Kaggle competition, people that were doing okay were getting about 99.6 dice and the winners were about 99.7 dice, right? Um, so here's our standard up sample. This is all as before. And so now we can check our dice metric. And so you can see on dice metric, we're getting like 968 at 128 by 128. And so that's not great. Okay. So oh, that's the real. Um, so let's try unit. And I'm calling it unit-ish because as per usual, I'm creating my own somewhat hacky version, right? Kind of trying to keep things as similar to what you're used to as possible and doing things that I think make sense. Um, and so there should be plenty of opportunity for you to um, at least make this more authentically UNET by looking at the exact kind of grid sizes and like see how here the size is going down a little bit. So they're obviously not adding any padding. Um, and then they're doing here, they've got some cropping going on. There's a few differences, right? Um, but one of the things is because I want to take advantage of transfer learning, that means I can't quite use UNET. So here's another big opportunity is what if you create the UNET down path and then add a classifier on the end and then train that on ImageNet and you've now got a, an ImageNet trained classifier which is specifically designed to be a good backbone for UNET, right? And then you should be able to now come back and get pretty close to winning this old competition. Uh, it's, not, it's actually not that old. It's fairly recent competition because, you know, that pre-trained network didn't exist before. But if you think about like what YOLO v3 did, 
it's basically that, right? They, they created Darknet, they pre-trained it on ImageNet, and then they used it as the basis for their founding boxes. So, um, again, this kind of idea of pre-training things which are designed not just for classification, but defined for other things is just something that nobody's, nobody's done yet, right? And as we've... <laughs> Um, but as we've shown, you know, you can train ImageNet for 25 bucks in three hours now. So, um, and if people in the community are interested in doing this, you know, hopefully I'll have credits I can help you with as well. So if you do, you know, the work to get it set up and give me a script, I can probably run it for you. Um, so for now, though, we don't have that. So we're going to use um, ResNet. Um, so... Um, so we're basically going to start with this, uh, let's see, um, with get base. And so base is our base network. And uh, that was defined back up in this first section, right? So get base um, is going to be something that calls whatever this is. And this is ResNet 34. So we're going to grab our ResNet 34. And cut model is the first thing that our Kongnet builder does. It basically removes everything from the adaptive pooling onwards. And so that gives us back the backbone of ResNet 34. Okay, so get base is going to give us back our ResNet 34 backbone. Um, okay, and then we're going to take that ResNet 34 backbone and turn it into a, I call it a unit 34. Right? So what that's going to do is it's going to save that ResNet that we passed in, and then we're going to use a forward hook, just like before, to save the results at the second, fourth, fifth, and sixth blocks, which, as before, is the basically before each stride two convolution. Uh, then we're going to create a bunch of these things we're calling unit blocks. And the unit block basically says, um, so these unit blocks are these things. These are unit blocks. So the, the unit block tells us, um, you know, well, we have to tell it um, how many things are coming from the, from the kind of previous layer that we're upsampling, how many are coming across, and then how many do we want to come out, right? Um, and so the amount coming across is entirely defined by whatever the base network was, right? It's like whatever, whatever the downward path was, um, we need that many layers. And so this is a little bit awkward, and actually um, one of our um, master students here, Karim, has actually created something called um, a dynamic unit that you'll find in fastai.unit.dynamicunit, and it actually calculates this all for you and automatically creates the whole unit from your base model. Um, it's got some minor quirks still that I want to fix. By the time the video's out, it'll definitely be working, and I will um, at least have a notebook showing how to use it and possibly a additional video. Um, um, but for now, you know, you'll just have to go through and do it yourself. You can easily see it just by, um, once you've got a, a ResNet, you can just go, um, you know, just type in its name and it'll print out all the layers and you can see how big, uh, how many activations there are in each block. Um, or you could even uh, have it printed out for you for each, for each block automatically. Um, anyway, I just did this manually. Um, and so the unit block is, um, works like this. Um, so you said, okay, I've got this many coming up from the previous layer, I've got this many coming across, this X I'm using across, across from the, the downward path, this is the amount I want coming out. Now, um, what I do is I then say, okay, we're going to create a certain amount of convolutions from the upward path and a certain amount from the cross path, and so I'm going to be concatenating them together. So let's divide the number we want out by two. Right, and so we're going to have our cross convolution take our cross path and create number out divided by two, and then the upward path is going to be a conv transpose 2D, right, because we want to increase upsample, and again, here we've got the number in divided by two, and then at the end I just concatenate those together. All right, so I've got an upward sample, I've got a cross convolution, I concatenate the two together. Right? And so that's all a unit block is. And so that's actually a pretty easy module to create. 
And so then in my forward path, I need to pass to the forward of the of the unit block the upward path and the cross path. So the upward path is just wherever I'm up to so far. Right? But then the cross path is whatever the value is of whatever the activations are that I stored on the way down. Right? So as I come up, it's the last set of save features that I need first. And then as I gradually keep going up further and further and further, eventually it's the first set of features. Okay? And so um, there are some more tricks we can do to make this a little bit better, but this is this is a good start. Right? <clears throat> so if we try this, so the simple upsampling approach looked horrible, right, and had a dice of 968. A unit with everything else identical, except we've now got these unit blocks, has a dice of 985, right? So that's like we've kind of halved the error with with everything else exactly the same. And more to the point, you can look at it. This is actually looking somewhat car-like compared to our non-unit equivalent, which is just a blob. No? Because you know, trying to do this through down and up path, it's just it's just asking too much, you know. Where else when we actually provide the downward path pixels at every point, it can actually start to create something carish. So um, at the end of that we'll go dot close to again remove those SFS. Uh, features to taking up GPU memory uh, go to a smaller batch size a higher size um, And you can see the dice coefficients really going up. This is just so notice here. I'm lo I'm loading in Right the 128 by 128 Version of the network. Okay, so we're doing this progressive resizing trick again So that gets us 99.3 and then unfreeze to get to 99.4 and you can see it's now Looking pretty good. Okay, go down to a batch size of four, size of 1024. Um, load in what we just did with the 512, takes us to 99.5. Unfreeze takes us to 99, we'll call that 99.6. And <laughs> um, And as you can see, that actually looks good. Right? In accuracy terms, 99.82. Um, you know, you can see this is looking like something you could just about use to cut out. I think to, you know, at, at this point, there's a couple of minor tweaks we can do to get up to 99.7. Um, but really the key thing then I think is just maybe to do a, you know, a, a few bit of smoothing maybe, or a little bit of post-processing. Um, you can go and have a look at the, Carvana winners blogs um, and see some of these tricks, but as I say the difference between where we're at 99.6 and What the winners got of 99.7? You know is it's not heaps um, And so really that just the unit on its own pretty much um, pretty much solves our problem um, Okay so that's it. So the last thing I wanted to mention is now to come all the way back to bounding boxes Because you might remember I said our our bounding box Model was still not doing very well on small objects So hopefully you might be able to guess where I'm going to go with this which is that for the bounding box model um, remember how we, we we had at different grid cells we spat out outputs of, of, of our model and It was those earlier ones with the small grid sizes that weren't very good. So well, how do we fix it? You net it Right, let's have an upward path with cross connections Right, and so then we're just going to do a unit and then spit them out of that because now those those um, finer grid cells have all of the information of that path and that path and that path and that path to leverage now, of course um, This is deep learning. So that means you can't write a paper saying We just used UNET for bounding boxes. You have to invent a new word So this is called feature pyramid networks or <laughs> FPNs. okay, and like 
the, literally, the paper, this is part of the retina net paper, which is actually a, a, a no, it's not the retina bit paper. It was used in the retina net paper. It was, it was it created in an earlier paper specifically about FPNs. And like, if memory serves correctly, they did briefly cite the UNET paper, but they kind of made it sound like it was this vaguely, slightly connected thing that maybe some people could consider slightly useful. But it, it really, FPNs as units. Okay, um, I don't have an implementation of it to to show you, um, but you know it'll be a fun thing maybe for some of us to try. And some of us have already some I, I haven't yet, but I know some of the students have been trying to to get it working well um, on the forums. Um, so yeah, uh, interesting thing to try. So I think a couple of a uh, couple of things to look at after this class, um, uh, as well as the other things I mentioned, would be playing around with FPNs. Um, and also maybe trying uh, Kerem's dynamic unit. Um, uh, they would both be interesting things to look at. All right, so um, so you guys have all been through 14 lessons of me talking at you now, so I'm sorry about that. Um, thanks for putting up with me. Um, you know, I think it, it's, it, it's, you're going to find it hard to find people who actually are as, know as much about training neural networks in practice as you do. Um, it'll be really easy for you to overestimate how capable all these other people are and underestimate how capable you are. Um, so like the main thing I'd say is like, please practice. Um, please, just because you don't have this constant thing getting you to come back here every Monday night now, it's very easy to kind of lose that momentum. So find ways to keep it, you know, you know, organize a study group, you know, or a book reading group, or get together with some friends and work on a project, or, you know, do something more than just deciding I want to keep working on X. Like, it, it's going to need to involve probably, unless you're the kind of person who's super motivated and you know that whenever you decide to do something, it happens. That's not me, right? It's like... I know if something to happen, I have to like say, yes, David, in October, I will absolutely teach that course. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, I better actually write some material. Like, that's the only way I can get stuff to happen. So um, we've got a great community there on the forums. If people have ideas for ways to make it better, please tell me. You know, if, if you think you can help with, you know, if you want to create some new forum or moderate it in some different way or whatever, just... Let me know, right? You, you can always PM me. Um, and there's a lot of projects going on through GitHub as well. Lots of stuff. So, yeah, I hope to see you all back here at something else. And thanks so much for joining me on this journey.